Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Digital Marketing. I am your host, Lauren Gray, in beautiful Las Vegas. Viva Las Vegas. Viva Las Vegas, which is actually making 8.30 my time. My only concern is, is that I have had issues with my earbuds before and uh, don't know if I have audio. I actually put me on my phone. And my only concern is, oh, is that I have it's had issues there. with my earbuds before. Good. Sorry. I always have to check the technical before I go to the Rio. Uh, I want to make sure I had audio for it. So you were just seeing him talking face going, hey, he seems to be saying something, but I don't know what it is. Anyway, for those who are watching the show, I actually have a weekly, regular time. Thank you so much for joining us. It is over three years. This actually puts us over the crest. We're into now our fourth year. We get to legitimately sit back and say, my gosh, we've done 157 shows and counting, and we're in our fourth year of doing this on a weekly basis, no matter where we are. And in this case, as I mentioned before, it is in Las Vegas, where I had the pleasure of being asked to speak as the closing keynote to the Nevada Hotel and Lodging Association and HSMAI's Las Vegas Chapters Revenue Optimization Conference. Um, I wouldn't call it a baby rock because rock, of course, is a much more encompassing uh, all-day event, although we did spend a, almost the entire day, almost the entire session length. Uh, we did some great combinations of uh, content that were presented in rock in, in Houston this year, and also what I present on the road when I speak to the Revenue Optimization uh, Convergence Education and Training Program, uh, affectionately known as Rocket, uh, where we do now, uh, we've done to 29 different cities. And uh, I incorporated a lot of uh, some of the points with that because um, amazingly, even though we repeat contextually a lot of the message, uh, it's still a message that's new to some. And that is the convergence of revenue management and digital marketing or marketing in general. I'd like to say there's differentiation between digital marketing and marketing, but marketing has become such an all encompassing aspect of uh, marketing in general. It um, right now represents all in the mid 70 percentile uh, all marketing efforts. It does still touch even the traditional marketing that is outside of the digital, uh, whether it be in lead time or um, continuation or content uh, uh, similarities, what have you, it still affects all the other aspects of marketing. So we had a wonderful time talking and discussing exactly how to do that. It's wonderful to know that revenue management uh, for hotels and digital marketing need to work together, but what exactly does that translate to? How exactly does that happen? Uh, and uh, we go into some good detail as to uh, creating a kind of vernacular, uh, a language of similarities, which is based on what we call KPIs, performance indicators, uh, where both the revenue manager and the digital marketer are speaking the same language, so to speak. Uh, not so to speak, but literally, uh, where they're both with the same mindset of goals. They have the same understanding of what both are trying to attain, and there's a mutual responsibility to them, uh, to each other on that so that um, one isn't left to risk and the other one is left not to, that there is a um, sink or swim. You're on the same boat together mentality and that you can't just say, I did my part and it's up to you to do the rest. It's to say, if we don't get this done, we both are on the bad side of a conversation compared to if we are successful, we're on the good side of a conversation. So that's pretty much in a nutshell kind of what both Rocket does when we do our weekly show, um, our weekly, um, our uh, city by city uh, presentations. We have three more this year. I believe uh, Toronto's our, in November, we have Toronto as our first one, then we'll be going to uh, Boston, and then I think Philadelphia is the third after that. I'm not certain I have to look, and we're still in the formation of that. I think that's the three cities that we'll be doing in November. Uh, they're a lot of fun. The team that I get to, to travel with, uh, Bonnie Buckheiser is a revenue genius when it comes to methodologies, terminologies, practicalities. Uh, she has the lion's share of the presentations for the day when it comes to functionalities and what to do. Uh, and then I have a, a really good portion of it to show the uh, convergence between us, digital marketers and revenue managers. And uh, a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And it, it's at a very property level uh, engagement. The people that attend for some reason, all of a sudden there's two of me, I think. Yes, there's two of me, and I have no idea from a technology point of view why that is the case, but there is. Um, so anyway, that's my conversation about Rocket. So for those of you who are in those three cities, uh, I can only but highly recommend that you think and consider to join us um, from a property level. I said it's, it's incredibly helpful because a lot of times the general manager, the revenue manager, and his marketer or his salesperson who's handling marketing or even the salesperson doesn't know how to speak to the others, and it gives them a 
a time to sit and hear and listen to really how to create that dialogue, how really to <clears throat> understand what the revenue manager is trying to do uh, and the revenue manager to understand what the marketer is trying to do and to realize that both of them have missing pieces to a puzzle, uh, that revenue management has a very unique uh, set of data that can be incredibly useful to uh, digital marketers because it gives them a horizon line in which to target for. And for revenue managers, it, it's a eye opener as to the data that's available to them from their marketing side that answers a lot of questions or didn't even know that they could answer questions on some of the data that's being collected and used by digital marketers. And uh, for salespeople and operations people, general managers and so forth, it gives them a wonderful opportunity to understand how they can collaborate with them in helping augmenting and supporting and getting benefit from a symbiotic relationship between revenue managers and digital marketers. So again, great stuff. And again, and for those who may be seeing this from the Las Vegas market that attended uh, the Rock, uh, Rock Conference for the Nevada Hotel and Lodging Association, HSMI local chapter, um, thank you again. It was a great session. I hope you got out of it what uh, was presented. We had some great uh, dialogues. Calvin Anderson from Red Lion uh, was uh, in uh, debate with uh, Kelly McGuire uh, from uh, MGM. And uh, we had Val Ross uh, from Star with some fascinating inside market data. It's always, a, it, we all try to be skeptical as to what the anticipation of the future will be for marketing. We're on the longest run of growth. Uh, I think actually uh, when it comes to the bull market is marketing. I think Time Magazine had it that if we can make it to August 22nd of this year and still validate that it's a bull market, it will have been the longest bull market in history. Um, if they can prove that it is still a bull market, uh, the, date, the data always is, has a latency factor to it. Uh, but if that's the case, we also know from a hotel's perspective that we are in uh, one of the longest runs, the longest run I've ever been in, in the sense of positive growth, RevPAR and ADR and so forth. However, we are at certain plateaus. And if Robert were here with us, he would be able to uh, elaborate more on some of the uh, potential, hmm, not certain that's going to happen kind of thing uh, when it comes to... Uh, uh, data as uh, longevities that we still present. Some of the interesting data that did get presented by <coughs> Val Ross uh, yesterday from Smith Travel is that there is, uh, for the earlier part of several years now, there has been a decline <coughs> or an averaging of large box openings. Now, she was speaking to the Las Vegas market when she was tailoring this conversation, but she was referring to, you know, of course, large hotels, big footprints. There had not been many in the pipe. When we've had this discussion on this show before where there have been a lot of uh, property builds and still are a lot of property builds that are on the limited service or at best medium full flag scale. Uh, they're not building them as big as they used to be. They don't do them like they used to kind of thing. They're not out for the big space. And there were very few that were in the pipeline for that kind of size footprint that's growth. Uh, I'm witness to it as a matter of fact behind me with the curtains. Um, I'm watching uh, the landscape of Las Vegas change even more uh, where they're building new things. I'm staying at the, uh, the Win Encore. Uh, great hotel, phenomenal. Uh, Chris uh, Flat went over and, and uh, gave me a wonderful mandate. She's the uh, senior vice president of the organization. Um, and it was a pleasure to be able to talk with her a little bit. It's always great to talk to people that deal with such a unique market like Las Vegas. But anyway, the large boxes are on the upswing, according to Star Travel, that they, they, uh, the travel, that they are uh, in the pipeline. Or begin to, there's begin, begin to have more in the pipeline uh, that's coming along. And... Uh, that's going to uh, change a little bit of the landscape where those located, obviously, because when you put a very large box in a market, I would say even in the Las Vegas market, you're still dealing with such an increase in inventory, uh, staffing requirements, uh, on and on that are of such a scale that some people, I mean, it still is, to me, so impressive to see large operations like here at the Encore or the Wynn or any of the large ones, Caesars Palace, uh, MGM, what have you. Uh, the scale of operations necessary for it to be maintained. The, uh, I would say, almost Disney-esque way. And I say Disney in the sense that um, it's always been the benchmark as to how Disney handles its operations in front of its guests, that uh, cast members, unique in itself, appear and disappear uh, within the park because of its thought-forward production as to where these uh, things were happening, so that all the things that happen in large-scale operations, such as this, the clean, the maintenance, uh, the attention to detail, the changes of decor and so forth happen in such a cyclic way that the average user of their uh, product do not get exposed to having to walk around construction or uh, deal with 
large crews doing something or to in any way deter from the, the magic or the experience that the the uh, large box is trying to present itself as. Uh, that's a testament to pre-planning and organization and, of course, manpower and resources, um, all of which, as we all know from every scale of business that we operate as, uh, is very variable. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the articles of contention that we we're going to potentially talk about today uh, was in regards to uh, what was called the Marriott experience. Um, <laughs> it was uh, uh, presented from, it was actually a Skift article, uh, and let's see, I forget, Mark Schaefer was the one that wrote it, um, about his experience about uh, simply trying to change a reservation from the Marriott that he was going to to a Marriott that he needed to go to because uh, he was okay so the whole story first off let me put the post the link up for it so that for those who are watching can see uh, what exactly they can read it themselves very quickly as to what it is that we're talking about but it is unfortunately all too common of a conversation and uh, oh, this is the business girl wasn't skip sorry skip had a follow-up article to this so basically what was happening was with mark he was uh driving uh to a marriott uh and i've just finished doing a road trip myself so 12 hours on the road you're about you're tired uh, especially downpouring rain makes it stressful traffic makes it stressful what have you so he was driving for about 12 hours, and that wasn't going to be the end of it. Uh, once he got to the hotel, he uh, had a package forwarded that had a lot of preparatory material for a client meeting early in the morning. Now, just for the record, I try to avoid these kind of combinations of timing because exactly for this reason, there's so many things that can go wrong and it puts things into jeopardy, but I think apparently Mark had the, uh, uh, the necessity to have to do this. So he was going to a Marriott, and it, unfortunately the package got sent to the wrong Marriott. So he was trying to simply say, well, I'm just going to change my Marriott reservation from the one I'm going to, which is 10 minutes away from the other one. Mr. Tim. Mr. Gray, how are you, sir? I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, standing on a soapbox and just beginning to tell the story of uh, Mark's uh, encounter with Marriott. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, go for it. Bye. And uh, I was just kind of giving the, 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 the backstory to it. And I was just, I got as far as saying, you know, Mark was going to Marriott after he's in the road, 12 hours, rain, not a pleasant thing to do. I just did it myself recently. Traffic's another one that I hate. Anyway, uh, realizing that the package he was forwarding to himself in preparation for a customer, I guess, a meeting in the morning was, in fact, um, at the wrong Marriott. So he thought, hey, I'll just change reservations. Uh, and there's several steps to what went wrong, but the, at the end of it, none of it worked. Um, and it was a pass off that, you know, he's, he's thinking he's going to talk to somebody that was in the process of trying to help him, willing to have to restart. Like, hi, are you trying to make a reservation? No. And he spent literally... I think the recount was an hour and a half while driving, trying to coordinate this. And then at the end of it, no, 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 nothing came back from Marriott saying, boy, did we drop the ball? Boy, you know, th that's terrible. So we're actually, from even looking at the tweet that they sent back, and to his point, uh, kind of a defensive, uh, like, hey, what you're saying isn't right. Uh, it was not three days, it was two days. And, uh, you know, it just, again, it goes back to what we always say. Uh, and, and have, we have seen it with success is admit the error and empathize with the guest and move forward right. from there. But I mean, I know I kind of encapsulated it very quickly, but I'd love to, to hear because you were the one that actually inspired the conversation by sending it over. So I'd love to hear well, why you. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know Mark really well. Mark is a friend of mine. We are both instructors at Rutgers Business School. So we've known each other for a long time. Good guy. Um, I want to point out that, you know, Mark's not nobody. And I, this shouldn't happen regardless of who you are. But, you know, this is a guy with 180,000 followers on Twitter, you know, uh, author of multiple best-selling books on social and things like that. Um, so, you know, he's pretty well known uh, and talks frequently about how, what a great experience he has had with Hyatt. So... <laughs> um, so, you know, it's not necessarily something where this shouldn't happen to any guest, but don't screw it up with somebody who can, you know, who's got a platform on top of that. I want to be right. very clear. I don't mean that that means Mark should get special treatment. Everybody no, should no. get special treatment. Well, I but mean, if, I, 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 but I, if you're going to get it wrong, there are people yeah. you, you can get away with getting it wrong. This, right. this isn't one of them. Yeah, um, well, I am a so, proponent of, from a business perspective that you should always be aware who's coming to your house. And... Right. 
you know, right. with that being said, then something like this, and I know that they don't do it, and I know nobody really does this except for uh, I mean, people that are aware of this value proposition. They don't really look at who's coming in. They're just looking at the numbers and the, the right. functionalities of it. And it's and yes, if you're going to piss somebody off, this is not necessarily the person or a type of person you want to piss off that actually has a large enough form to make an impact. You know, at the right. he's been right. So yeah, and and uh, full again, I've known Mark for a long time. He's not the kind of guy to exploit his, you know, celebrity if I can use that word, just because he didn't get a good experience. In fact, he's really good about uh, being private about these things. And in fact, in the, the blog post he wrote up, he even talked about the fact that Marriott did what you always do and said, well, DM us and we'll have this conversation, you know, out of the public space. Right. So he so he did. And they didn't reply. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, no. you know, he used the terms in the in the headline epic fail. And while I'm not always the biggest fan of, of that phrase, this is one where I don't know if it was an epic fail, but it was a pretty big fail. It was a fairly large screw up, you know, not how you want to do it. Uh, and definitely, you know, not where you want to do it. Right. Right. Well, and it, but again, it goes to the value of the indicativeness that this is happening to more than just him. This wasn't if this was right. one out of a thousand stories and nine hundred nine and ninety of them were, you know, hey, this was great. I, I'm terribly sorry to have it. This just is that indicative. Yes, it's an epic fail, because if this is what's happening to somebody that is consciously aware of the intent of what the property is trying to do because they teach people how to do this. And it in itself creates this scenario of total, you know, cascading errors where, I mean, for those to read the article, I put the, the, the link up that was shared by you um, as to the stages that he went through, right. the things that all of us would have gone right. through right. only to end up where he is. And then on top of it, salt to the wound, the apparent, oh, well, uh, yes, hey, you know, what's really two, not three, and, you know, not much is being done or whatever. Right. Just, just to show you all the frustrations that all of us have. Right, right, exactly. You know, uh, there's a GM who I know really well, really good GM, who always said people remember three things about their interactions with you, right? They remember the bread, the coffee, and the stuff in the middle that you don't make right. <laughs> right? They remember the first interaction. They remember the last interaction. And if you screw something up in the middle and you don't fix it, they're going to remember yeah. that too. Yeah. And and this one, they fouled up the bread, they fouled up the coffee, and they fouled up the stuff in the middle and didn't make it right. You know, yeah. how many how many stories have we heard over the years of people who have recovered from one of these? And it's gone on to be a really great experience. Yes. You know, um, uh, one of the more bizarre um experiences of my career, a, a hotel that I've done some work with, uh, a, a client of mine uh, who will remain nameless, nameless for obvious reasons, had a service failure during the course of a guest stay. They did not do a good job. And as it happened, the guest posted on their Facebook page, on the on the hotel's Facebook page, that uh, the, 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 the guest in question was a minority, and this is relevant to the story, and the guest basically posted that because they were a person of color, they weren't being taken care of. And clearly the hotel, you know, there was no intent nor action in that regard in terms of, of not taking care of this person because they were a person of color. They just right. screwed up. It was a normal, ser a normal service failure, right? Um, mm -hmm. So they had to work doubly hard to, um, you know, reassure the guests that, a, they screwed up. B, they were sorry they screwed up. C, here's how they were going to make it right that they screwed up, et cetera. And what ended up happening was the guest did a, did a wonderful thing. They A, took down the comment, and B, put up a second comment actually saying, I posted something earlier in anger that was unfair, that, you know, maligned these people unfairly, et cetera, without, you know, actually having had a conversation with them, et cetera. They actually have been nothing but wonderful you know, and I'm sorry for even suggesting such a thing as, you know, yeah, it looks like it screwed up. Yeah, yes, it doesn't look like, yes, they screwed up. Um, but no, in no way did it appear to be motivated in any way by, you know, racial animus or anything along those lines. They just fouled up and they did a lot of wonderful things to make it better without just, you know, buying off the guest, right? It was right. more we'd love to hear your feedback on what we did that made it seem like that could be a thing. 
because that's never our intent. And we want to use this as an opportunity to learn and to grow and to say, how do we do better? Because clearly that's something we would never want to do. And if you felt that, then we did something wrong that led you to think that. And we right. want to know what that was so we can get better overall. Yeah. So yeah. it was, you know, it was really a really positive um, outcome of what was a bit of a horror show immediately. Yeah. Okay. But, but, and you're taking that point in mind. If Marriott had done, even if, if they follow their own policy of what they should have done in this circumstance, this would have turned into a feel good story. Because right. he probably, and, and I, I don't know him near as well, I know of him, I've, I've met him and so forth, and nothing I've ever met of Mark has ever said that he would have been this, no, I'm going to drive home the point regardless of what you've done. Oh, yeah, no, no. You no, know no. what I mean? Um, that had they come back and said, oh my God. Thank you for putting up with us. You know what I mean? Right. I can't believe we did this, blah, blah, blah. Please allow us to do this, blah, 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 whatever. And again, not necessarily to buy him off. And certainly not just because he had a platform large enough to stand on. But right. please let us show you how we will handle everybody that ever, unfortunately, ever would ever have to go through this because that's the amplification we're worried about. And it would turn into a recovery story. It would have returned right. in. Guess how bad it was before it got good. You right. know? Right. Instead, and, no, it didn't end that way. <laughs> right. Well, and, and you know, and there are those people. I want to be fair. Clearly, there are people who take advantage of the situation. You know, oh, the, by far. The influencers who use their platform to, you know, beat hotels over the head and say, "If you don't do X for me, I'm going to say negative things about you." I want to be really clear. Mark is not that guy at all. Anybody who knows him, anybody who reads his stuff, he prefers, as always to talk about the positive. You know, let me show you examples of people doing it well, right? Mm -hmm. So so this uh, for anybody who's watching the show or you know watching it later who goes, "Yeah, right, this is one of these guys, not that guy, not what he does." And the travel space is not his core space by any stretch. So he's definitely not trying to like, you know, make a name for himself on Marriott's coattails. Um, this is more they 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 did a bad job. And what, you know, it's funny, he and I actually had had dinner the other night. Um, and where this came up, um, you know, we were having a conversation about it. He wasn't aware of the reality of, you know, the fact that there is the franchisor, the management company, and the ownership group. And he said, you know, what's funny about this is I literally found myself wondering, who owns this property? Like, who's responsible for this property? In other words, you know, there are sometimes seams in our industry, right? Seams in the in the uh, stitching sense, right? You know, uh, where the uh, ownership group hands off to the management company or the management company hands off to the franchisor, right, to the brand. And we shouldn't let the seams show to a guest, right? A customer shouldn't be aware of that reality. And here's a guy who's not in the industry, doesn't know the industry, and literally found himself wondering, you know, who ultimately is responsible for this thing? Because it didn't seem like anybody was. Mm. And that was kind of the problem. You know, I tell a story years ago, and I'm going to bash the brand, and it's okay, I don't care. Uh, but I, I direct TV years ago. I bought a home with uh, a dish attached to it. It was the first time I'd ever had... Uh, uh, direct TV or any kind of satellite television. I, it was not a world I knew anything about. And I simply wanted to purchase television programming on the dish that I had. It couldn't be done. You know, because one company sells the dish, one company services the dish, and one company sells the programming. Yeah. And ultimately, I ended up a learning, I, I ended up having to buy a second dish to be able to get television to my house. Wow. And, and B, B, learned way more about the way that, you know, uh, uh, DirecTV <laughs> works from a business model than I should ever have to care about. It. <laughs> Why do I give a crap that there's different business entities, you know, handling different parts of the transaction? And that's kind of what happened to Mark, too. Yes, I, yes. I, you know, I, I, just from personal experience, and I'll say this from a personal opinion. Again, this is not to reflect anybody. Like this, this is what they should do. It's just I feel that this has been the way I've seen it successful. When a general manager of a hotel that has uh, has to be answering to several bosses, the oh, management yeah, company, yeah. the asset company, the brand, um, the ones that I feel that succeed at this, go to their team and say, "It's us. It's right. us." Okay. Right. 
I'll deal with when the brand walks in the door and we raise the blam frag and we all salute it. I'll deal with them as to what their goals are. Okay. And when the ownership comes in, we raise the flag of the ownership and we <laughs> salute them. I'll deal with the owner as to what they want. And the same goes on for the management company. But what we deal with, we deal with the team. We live and breathe together. And our guests, to your point, see only us. Right. The GMs that fail at this are, hey, management wanted me to do this. Ownership wanted me to do this. This is the brand statement that none of them are green. Pick which one you want to blame, but it's not us. Those right. are the ones I think that don't succeed at it because that's when you get these experiences that Mark had where it's not them, it's them. And it's not us, it's them. And, 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 and as long as they feel they can hide behind something because that's their, 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 their way of survival, then you're going to have these circumstances where even though the best policies were placed in every one of those positions, it all failed because none of it worked. Right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I'm actually looking for his blog for a second just because there was one point that I thought was interesting. Uh, where was it? Sorry. No, um, I didn't know if you cut this earlier on. I, I'm, I'm actually in Viva Las Vegas. Oh, I nice. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. It was it was fun. I, I learned uh, about powered curtains in a way I didn't want to learn about them. <laughs> you know, when you get up in the morning, okay, and you hit oh, everything sorry. on. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah, and, then you walk to, and then you walk to the bathroom and you should walk back and go, wow, it's awful bright. Holy shit. Right, 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 right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Fortunately, it was on the 32nd floor, so it's not as if, uh, you know, God and Country has now had a new exposure, but it's uh, it was more one of those, yeah, let's close. What's the button for the current? Because I, I got to say, the Encore, beautiful place. Uh, I love the automation that they have. I love the you know the, the, the station beside the bed that has the controls. And, you know, you can do night lights and all this. I think it's right, great. Right. But if you don't know what you're doing, do not attempt this at home because you can turn some stuff you've on you know, you had no intent, like opening the curtains. Right, 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 right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, so I found one of the things that he said that I thought was really uh, uh, fantastic, you know, where he talked about the fact of, um, oops, heck, I screwed and then I missed it. Oh, so the message from Marriott is, quote, we don't give a crap. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, which is never what you want your customers to think, you know. Uh, it's just not good at all, you know. And 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 he he had a great point that I really would point out, which was don't spend a dime on marketing until you can deliver the goods to your customers. I like that. Yes, I saw that too. I thought that was yes. The the um, I think it goes to is like it, it's a fair weather friend when things are great and they love you being the footprint in the, in the market that you're in, they're your best buddy. When this stuff happens, they, they do things like, Hey, we don't own the place. You know, they, they have to represent themselves. You know, we have to coordinate it with the franchisee. They get this distancy aspect to them. And it's kind of, oh, and then and I, I was, I don't want to even say mayor. I would, in all fairness, having had to run franchise hotels and now work with clients that have them, there is always the fair weather friend relationships that exist. Well, where when things yeah. are good, everybody loves to share. Yeah, because everybody wants to share and in in bask in the glory of whatever success may have had. And by the same token, nobody wants to go over and take the bullet just because they can in a circumstance where it went bad. So, uh, you know, you, you, you can point to you know, ownership, you can point to management, you can point to you know, branding and so forth. It's hard to find those kind of stand up people that say, I will let you get the credit and I'll take the blame. Right, because right. there's a few and far between in that sense. Robert wants to know if you're going to sign autographs at uh, Smith Travel next week. <laughs> if I am, um, I, unlikely because I can't imagine anyone's going to ask for. <laughs> I, I suppose. Be... I suppose if somebody asked for one, I would sign an autograph. There you go. I... Well, if I was there, I would do it for you. I, I think I'm the only one that's not attending. Everybody I talked to yesterday. Uh, Oh, the reason why I'm in Vegas, I, I started the show with this, that I spoke at the uh, Nevada Hotel and Lodging Association, and uh, it's just me. I wanted to do a new uh, uh, ROC, uh, Revenue Optimization sure. uh, Conference, and it was kind of, it was fun. We took some of the things from ROC of Houston this past year, and then mine from when I do the Rocket uh, training that's in the week, in the uh, cities that we travel to, and we kind of put it together. It was a lot of fun, um, and good represent great representation. The room was great. We had, uh, I don't know, 90-ish people, uh, all the big uh, players and so forth, and it's it's interesting. I got to say, having those people in the room, I, I do a thing, and you know, I think I've told you this before, where I challenge the room. It's like, give me your gnarliest revenue management problem. And if I and we can't solve it in the few minutes we have together, you'll get another three hours of my time, whether you deem it worthy or not, that I'll continue to try to answer that question for you. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. 
And um, in some rooms, it works where people really open up with a problem. I mean, we're not, we never discuss rate or anything. Of course. There's always that you know, strategy comp marketing. And, uh, finally, I mean, nobody wanted to really crack open with it because nobody wanted to share anything that was any way usable by anybody else in the room because it's such a high competition in, you know, ecosystem. Oh, yeah, here. sure, sure, sure. You know, so it was a little hard. We finally got MGM to crack open, and it was fun. They really, I thought it was great in the sense that it made them think about ways of approaching the issue that they all probably had the same problem, but had them think about it in ways they hadn't thought about it before. Is that it was meant to be an extension of the uh, the conversation of revenue management and digital marketing's convergence. So that's kind of where all that came from. But it was fun nonetheless because, as much as I feel that I keep saying the same thing over and have been for the past year doing these programs, it still falls on new ears. People are still coming to the thought concept that this is a rational way of doing business, which I always am surprised with. Actually, I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm i not surprised only because I was having this discussion earlier this week. Um, I put a thing up on LinkedIn. This is uh, uh, wasn't my content. I just linked to an article um, from uh, Christopher S. Penn where he talked about the end of digital marketing, right? Uh, and the post is from about a year ago. And, it, and his point is uh, that uh, – um, hold on one second. I'm trying to look for it. His point is that, you know, with – the integration of digital and with um, offline, right? That there is no, dis you know, that that there's no distinction between digital and marketing any longer, right? You know, all marketing is digital essentially. Now, what's funny is our good friend, friend of the show, um, Max Starkov, posted a reply where he said, you know. Um, Tim, the, the days of distinction between traditional and digital marketing are long gone. In hospitality, it's been digital first for at least 15 years and digital only for at least eight years now. To which I replied, could completely agree, Max. I've been saying it's all e-commerce since at least 2011 with a link to a post <laughs> called It's All E-Commerce. <laughs> um, but, but, and this is the point, and it gets right to what you were talking about. What's amazing is how many other industries and businesses still struggle with this concept. Mm -hmm. I had at least three conversations this week with people in the hospitality industry and people outside the hospitality industry in leadership positions, in marketing, in e-commerce, in uh, product management, in operations, in general management, et cetera, who talked about this, you know, how digital is sort of the other. It's sort of this separate thing. Even... <laughs> today and i i heard a, i heard a conversation i think i can share this I, if i can't have shared this i will i will pretend later that you know i don't know where i got this but i was talking to somebody who we know really well who i know particularly well in the industry um who uh uh you know had some interns this summer from various places all about uh and how one of the interns worked in distribution for the first time in her career and was shocked to learn what distribution was because she goes to a very well recognized hotel school. Some might even call it the hotel school. <laughs> and, and they don't have any classes on distribution. And this whole notion, and I, the point I'm trying to get to, and it ties back to what you were talking about, this whole notion that, that the silos that exist between these different pieces of the business, whether it's digital, whether it's distribution, whether it's rev management, whether it's marketing, and the lack of communication and the lack of connection among them is going to kill a lot of hotels because mm -hmm. they're leaving money on the table. They're not approaching this in a thoughtful way where it all integrates well. Mm -hmm. And each piece is sort of, if it's accounted for at all, is accounted for entirely separately from all yes. the other stuff. And that's a epic fail of another kind yes yes and and, and and it's kind of fun because i uh and i do this as a taunt and i and i probably come off cocky and i tell people in the audience i'm probably coming off cocky by asking these questions i said out of 29 cities i've been to you would be the 30th i'm asking the same two series of questions and yeah. i've yet to have a one person answer one question legitimately with a backup of information in any capacity I says, oh, first yeah. off what is your what is your what is your uh most profitable channel yeah Okay. Now I get answers like, "Well, direct channel." Like that's the cost 
you know, profitable channel, but right, right. Is the percentage of that channel's contribution really making it the most profitable right, channel. Right. I mean, it's the most cost effective channel. I'll give you that. We are, that's pretty much, yeah, that's, that's baseline, but is it actually your most profitable channel? Mm -hmm. And then the second is, um, what is your percentage of direct channel contribution? Just mm -hmm. tell me what your direct channel is actually contributing to all of the channels contribution. And mm -hmm. that, that one still has gone unanswered. That oh, yeah. one still is one that has not been able to be answered by anybody ever asked that. I said, so how can you expect a well-performing Pinto to win NASCAR? No matter how good you make it, it isn't enough to do it. If you're only getting five or 10% direct channel, right. no matter how good you're driving business through that thing, it's still a little pinhole compared to the 90% sitting out there. That's right. And so you can't wager all your budgeting ideas on just one small channel. So that's where some well, come from. Well, and I would, I would argue if it's only 5% of your business, by definition, you're doing something wrong already. It, yes. I yes. mean, realistically, right? Yes. If, if digital and if direct isn't, you know, 20, 25, 30% of your business today, immeasurable heads in beds business, you're doing it wrong. Oh, and by that's, far. And that's before we get to the product, the production it it influences through other channels, right? Yes. I'm talking just measurable business of twenty twenty five percent. You yep. you got some problems. You uh, get, from, you can give one of us a call. <laughs> yeah, 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 you should call one of us, and we can help you with the problem. Uh, so, so the guy from C of N, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm saying the guy from C of N because I actually talked to him for a little bit, and I totally blew his name here. Um, was uh, he had a bit of a presentation on stats and so forth? It was kind of fun to to watch and there was a couple of eye openers for me that I, I had thought about and didn't think really were real. Um, he said that electronic uh, contribution or electronic business, digital business mm -hmm. is 77% of their total perspective right now. Oh, and, I believe that's true. Yeah. Now that one was like, okay, so there's a legitimized number as to the, um, uh, but then he was showing some DMA markets, New York being one of them where group rate was actually higher than transient rate. Really? And I'm like, Really? That's what I said. I'm like, really? And then, of course, he went on to explain, you know, that, of course, makes challenges for your transit because then you have, you know, what is what you do your block dissolution? Like, if somebody finds a better transit rate, what happens to your group blocks and so forth right, and so right. on? And he didn't dive into it much because he wasn't out to create a solution. He was just really presenting numbers and facts for this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. there is a, uh, a legitimizing way of validating that if you're going to bring us group business, the way he was describing it, if you're going to bring group business, then to be able to leverage the advantageous scalabilities of costs associated with the group contract, they put the weight on the group planner to keep people in the block because if they don't hit certain metrics, their pricing models change within all the other ancillary things they're doing. Now, these were for large footprints. I'm still sitting going, even at the higher cost, you're putting the burden on the attendee. Yeah, yeah, I'm still not understanding how that works. You know right, what I mean? I mean well, and it ignores the fundamental reality that your customer is has a lot of incentive to know what the correct rates are, what the best rate is. I mean, mm -hmm. what's to prevent them from just booking the cheaper rate? Or just go somewhere else and show up at the doorstep and be like, yeah. it's not my event, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't get that one at all. I don't either. I don't either. But it was, New York was one of two that he pointed out. I should say the other one, that was either San Diego or L.A. or something had the same thing in it. I'm sitting there going, how can your group rate float above your transient yeah, uh, and still I sustain I that. So I, it was one of those things. And then um, uh, Val I went over and pointed out something. I'm sure it's part of the conference that you're going Like I said, I'm probably the only person that's not going next week. Uh, <laughs> uh, where she was showing big box, big footprints coming into the pipeline again. Oh, sure, and, uh, sure. And I was I was not surprised, but I was I was kind of, I was happy for it. But then again, I'm just kind of curious as which markets, because I'm sitting here looking at construction here in Vegas. Uh, and there's some big mamma jamma things that are in product project right now that they're building on that. I'm like, wow, for a market that already has what it has at the density that it has it, uh, you're really putting a lot more into it because there, there's three major projects right in front of me that they're cramping, you know, they're ramping up for it. And right. just the scalability of staff and so forth. It's just, I'm always impressed. I'm always impressed when I come out here. It's like going to Orlando in that sense too. the scale of what the operations are like here. Uh, New York, again, are three iconic destination markets, I think, that are unique into themselves. I don't know if I put anybody else directly in that category with them in the U.S. Anyway. Well, in the U.S., yeah, no. But uh, the, the, the challenge I have with it, and you just hit it on the head, Lauren. Um, you just really hit it on the head. That I think is a real problem as we go forward, and we're seeing this in a lot of markets right now, is staff. Um, you know, being able to staff... It, it, 
it's less about, you know, uh, the inventory to meet the demand. It's uh, sorry. It's less about, is there sufficient demand to need that level of inventory? Because mm -hmm. I think in some markets, that's absolutely true. We still have plenty of, I don't know about plenty. We still have runway in terms of pipeline coming into the market that can, that, that there's su sufficient demand to require. What I am running into a lot, and I'm seeing this with clients, I'm seeing this with other hotels I'm talking to, is that staff is becoming a huge, huge problem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I think at least in part, not to, not to go back to the story and beat it to death, but at least in part with the Mark situation that we started the show with is driven by the fact that that's not quality staff, right? No. no. That's a, I shouldn't say quality staff. I should say ill-trained. I should say ill-incented, whatever. Like, there's a bunch of reasons why that could be true. They're, I'm not saying they're not quality people. I'm well, saying it's, it's, they it's, don't yeah. understand the hospitality industry if, yeah. that's, that, that's if they the think those are acceptable responses. I, I, I agreed with you because I'm not, I'm not attacking their persona as a person. Right, I right. think I think a lot of people want to do the right thing and they want they want to do good for the most part. I think, and I put this down to being quality staff because staff puts them into the category of their training presence as to their responsibility <laughs> role. Right. And so I will I will agree to say that that it's about probably finding quality staff because that that honest then is on the training. That honest is on the company that brought them in and pays them. It's their responsibility. Anything that a staff member does, other than out of personal belligerence and ignorance of willingness, I mean, I would say that if, if the only thing I can't train is your motivation, your desire. Everything else about whatever I know that you're wanting to know, I can train about, unless you don't want to know it, you know, right. for, the, for the most part. So with the staff, if they're hitting walls and been put in a box, and this is what you can't touch, and this is what you can't touch, and this is what I want you to do, and this is the only way I want you to do it, and you, you basically tear apart their persona to making it only a function of their staffing, then it is a fail of the ownership that they created that environment right. for them. Right. You know, right. And to that end, with Marriott's process and protocols and so forth, they basically have given them a script, and not everybody reads a script. Right, right. Well, it, it comes back to what is what are they held accountable for? Are they held accountable for, you know, resolving the calls quickly and cheaply, or are they held accountable for taking care of the guest? And I think you can do both of those things, because obviously there's a cost component and the like, but they also have to be trained of, are you doing right by the guest? You know, mm -hmm. and and in this specific example that we've talked about, clearly that's a miss. Right. right. Well, obviously they were there until their shift ended. Right. And <laughs> right. I've, I've, I have lived through the exact same environment that Mark was referring to. You know, I was checking out of one hotel and uh, I wanted to copy a paper copy of my portfolio because I always like to have a piece of something that they handed me, not just the email that they said they send and then I have to chase everything back down. And so I get it and I noticed in this particular traveling that I've been doing, they charged a per night pet fee when the policy was one pet fee for the entire stay. So I asked the girl, can you please go over and make the adjustment of these two off? I mean, it, it, and she's, oh, I'm sorry, so, 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 so on. She was new, okay? Mm -hmm. And she ended up compounding the problem and doubling mm -hmm. it. I said, no, no, no. And then literally as, as my witness, she's like, oh crap, it's my ship. Thank you. Uh, first one, and literally, the next person will be in in just a moment. This left the front desk unattended. She literally wow. left. Put her sign up saying, we're helping guests some, uh, somebody with you in just a moment. And ladies, limited service property. Okay, limited service property. Wait, and sure. left. Sure. And left. And then I'm waiting another 10 minutes because now I have double the problem. And I can't leave. And the next person comes in. And because uh, there was already somebody on property, but there's somewhere else. So there was nobody actually watching the front desk. So this person comes in, it's like trying to, I'm trying to describe the problem. She's like, I'm sorry, I'm new. I don't know exactly how to fix this. So I ended up having to leave going, golly, now I've really have to, now I have to go. And so I ended up calling the hotel back, uh, finally talking to the GM. The GM, of course, apologized. Didn't apologize for the fact that this is, but apologized that the event happened that I got charged so much. Still had to dispute the charge. And they had to cancel the entire thing and recreate it and charge me new because even the GM at that point did not know how to deconstruct the charges because I had checked out and then asked for a copy of the folio. So it turned into a post folio, not an active folio. Well, so you clearly, well clearly, you know, that's your mistake, Lauren. You should I know. know. Uh. You should know <laughs> as the customer their that's process right. so yes. well. You know, don't check out before you ask for charges. Yes. So... Uh, again, and, and then, of course, my wife, who used to be an accountant with Marriott, is like, 
I could tell them how to do it. I'm like, well, go in and tell them. And, and right. they just wouldn't right. listen to it. They just right. were like, you don't, we don't know who you are. We're not going to do what you tell us to do in our system. So, and it's, it's like, oh my gosh. But to that point, that's training. That's flat out training. Right. Right. And, but then we hear so many great stories where the, 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 uh, the guest person, the, 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 the staffer did not give up on it. They chased the guest down right. to get back their lost item. They, they right. went above and beyond and went to a local marketplace and found what it is the guest needed. You know, that they didn't call at the end right. of their shift and leave it to somebody else. Well, part of it is, you know, even in your example there, you know, there's a simple answer to this one, right? There's a very simple answer to this one that you don't have to be terribly sophisticated to do or the like, which is, you know, I'm sorry, Mr. Gray, I don't know how to address your problem. Let me have your contact information. Let me get on with your day. I mm -hmm. will talk to the appropriate people here and I will get back to you tomorrow at the end of the week, a week mm -hmm. from now. I mean, you don't even have to promise I'll get it to you, you know, within two hours. It's, this is gonna take me a little bit of time. Can I get your in contact information? Let me get back to you in a few days once I've had a chance to find out what the hell do we do here. Right. And, you know, I mean, I wanna help you out. You know, I'm not sure that I can do this, right? I mean, you can set mm -hmm. the right expectations, but why do you have to stand here while, you know, we sort out things that we should know how to do you know, so let me let me just get back with you when I have a chance to look at this and come back and give you a, a valid answer, and when I have more time to talk about it, right? Yep. I mean, uh, it does, it, yeah, it does bring me up to one thing that I do now. I've turned into a uh, not an advocate, but a, a, I don't know what better way of saying it. I want to, and I'm going to tackle uh, this pet traveling topic uh, in, in in now and in future ways. I've, I've always had domains that I have bought. Uh, for the purpose of thinking that I wanted to use it for a marketing perspective, uh, including owning Pet Trip, uh, Pet, Pet Trip Advisor, which I don't think will go far. I think they'll stop me. Uh, but a few others. <laughs> but but the yes. idea of they'll stop. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of it, it, to me. It's completely different. I understand where the commonality is. Um, but the traveling with a pet. We've done this now for two long trips, two 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 week trips. Yeah. And the uh, implied uh, idea that you're a pet friendly hotel. Uh, is ludicrous in many ways to many hotels. Uh, a pet tolerance maybe might be the closest thing to being positive about it. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're charging 150 per night, non-refundable, to have a pet with you, right? Okay, and your room rate is 99. Okay, um, there is not no pet friendliness to it all. There's no pet friendliness to right. that at all. Right. That's a we don't want pets, but since we're told that we have to because of brand requirement or something, we're going to go over and nail you 150 bucks. And then, and I, I mean this, when I pulled off the road one place, there was the cluster of the typical side of the highway roads. You know, there's six flavors of yep. brands yep. and so forth. And I'm looking, and one hotel packed with cars. Yep. And everyone else peppering with just a few cars. Yep. And the hotel we were going to was the hotel that had all the cars because as we go in, it was like Dogapalooza. I mean, there were pets everywhere because they were charging 20 a night. That's right. it, maximum of 60 bucks for right. up to a five night stay. And they had a pet walk with bags and this, they had bowls, they had treats at the door. The place was jamming. And so right. I asked Renee, because I was like this, you know, because I was trying to turn that this one thing, the advocacy of pet travel. And I had her look real quickly the rates of the other hotels. This was the most expensive hotel for us to stay in. Sure, sure. But the other hotels, no pet friendly or the hundred dollars a night, whatever it is, like this. But this place was packed full of pets, and they're all over the place. And the hotel was not dirty and pissed on and all the other stuff. No, sure, 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 sure. Right. You know, and I, and I don't advocate for it. people with pet allergies. Of course, this is a negative place. Oh, of course, stay. of course. But no, they realize their niche with their location on the road. We talk about those side of the road things. Absolutely. This was in that location that all of us were like, we have a dog, we got to get them out. We got to walk them. We're tired. It's six hours from somewhere else, blah, blah, blah. And they realized where they were that, that juxtaposition of halfway right. between here and there, right. That right. they could charge the rate, but they offered the special and they were jamming. Right. And I was just like, you go. <laughs> I've told this story many times because it, it makes me laugh. We, we did a college tour with my daughter. Uh, who uh, is vegan and um, you know we kept finding restaurants that said they were vegan friendly on their website and when we get to the restaurant what we learned that meant was that they wouldn't mock you for being vegan 
Or they had one dish that was kale. <laughs> no, no. They didn't have a dish. They were like, oh, well, it has no. butter, but otherwise it's vegan. Oh, it has milk, but otherwise it's vegan, you know. Oh, wow. Like, oh. And, you know, it, it, it was the kind of thing where, and it gets to your point of, if you're going to claim to be a thing, be the thing. And if you're not going to be the thing, don't pretend to be the thing. Right, right. You know. These folks weren't vegan friendly. They could barely spell the word vegan. They were very polite about the fact that they didn't have any food for my daughter, right? Uh, yeah. They were very friendly, but friendly to vegans in this case, yeah. or friendly for dogs or friendly for pets is not the same thing. Friendly to is not the same thing as, you know, actually accommodating of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. Right. We're not yeah. going to be mean to you because you have a dog. We're not going to be rude. We're not going to be rude that you're vegan. We're also not going to support your need. Right. 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 Yeah. No. They're very true in that sense. I mean, that goes back to the old days where you used to say you're, you know, on beachside, but really you're across the street or you know right. one block right. away or something, right. or right. you know, or you had something, but that's only during season. Or right. it's in truth in advertising in the oldest of senses. But it's also uh, from now. It's a it's a it's a razor's edge of, of profitability, sustainability, and then because again, going back to some of our older conversations, brands' existence was because of it. It uh, diminished the the potential of unfamiliarity or or, or, or uh, right. It lowered your risk. Yes, and it lowered now, you as a consumer's risk. Yes, and now. That has diminished in capacity because there is this new uh, uh, prevalent amount of information that you can stay at independent hotels. Ed likes to tout that there should be no reason that you ever be surprised at an independent hotel because you should be able to find out enough information about them in one fashion or form. And and so you have to find another reason to legitimize legitimize your loyalty, but your 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 value proposition. Yes, your value proposition. I mean, the, the, the line I use all the time, Lauren, is your brand is only as good as your last TripAdvisor review. Whether we like that or not, that's the fact, right? Guests know more about your property than many of your employees do because they have more incentive to know more about your property than many of your employees do, right? They care. It's their money. It's their trip. They want to make sure it goes well. Mm -hmm. So they're going to spend the time. They're going to spend the energy to find out does this property offer what I need for this trip, right? And so, yeah, independents are well positioned, and in some cases, not all, some cases better positioned because they can focus on the, we solve this problem, this problem, this problem, and we don't pretend to solve all the other crap, right? We don't. We're not held to a standard that says we must be, you know, pet friendly if we're legitimately not. They're not right. held to a standard where we must be, you know, we must offer free breakfast in the morning if we're actually not set up operationally to do that well. So we don't. But what we do is we partner with the restaurant across the street. We give you a voucher for 10% off or something like that. Mm -hmm. We partner with these folks because they they do that well. Uh, uh, Genuine, uh, a a real case, Um, um, the group of hotels that I work with down in Charleston, they are older historic buildings. They have a limited number of rooms. They don't have a fitness center on property. They mm-hmm. have partnered with a really high quality gym right across the street to offer fitness service capabilities. And they it gets them out of the business of doing something that they're not good at anyway, which is running a fitness center. <laughs> right? Let the gym be the fitness center and let the hotel be the hotel. Right? Right. I'm not saying it's right for everybody. I'm saying they are very honest and upfront about this is what we do and this is how we make it work if you want access to a fitness center, right? And it works out really well for them. It works out spectacularly well for them. Well, and I guess it goes also again back to, to okay, so for instance, um, thinking that your your guest is always uninformed or not aware of is, is, is such a, a bad thing for a, a, a marketer for any com- property or a hotel to do. But like for me, I, I tend to stay at limited services when I travel because I like the component of having a, a free breakfast in the morning that I don't have to mess with, that I can just stumble down to grab, eat there or bring back to the room depending upon circumstances sure, sure. Uh, when I'm traveling with my wife or what have you. And there is a standard breakfast that is given a menu that is given to all residents in or fail fields or whatever, sure. you know, that is out there, but there's also latitude that is allowed uh, for mm-hmm. what you can expand that on. 
And I continually, I talk about this residence in Mobile, Alabama, because of all the little things that I think that they do right. And one of them is they've decided that they're going to always have a better breakfast than what their required baseline is. Mm -hmm. They add the extra things to it that mm -hmm. are still brand compliant. It's not like they're going off in venture land and, and putting beignets in when there's none right. that exists. <laughs> but, but they're putting in the expanded hey, beignets. no beignets. I'm not spam. I know, right? Well, hey, now that rule holds if you're in New Orleans. But anyway, um, so they add this expanded menu because I got to tell you, after two weeks on the road and staying at the similarities of the same hotel over and over, right, right. I can tell you where they are in the menu cycle of whether it's turkey sausage <laughs> or scrambled right. eggs or overcooked eggs or whatever. And you right. just, I don't care if it's free. I can't eat it. Right, right. <laughs> right. Sure. But this place I love going to because they always have the extra layers to stuff that I get to go over and like, oh my God, they have this, they have that, they have this, you know, whatever it is. And and it is those little things that keep me that when I go through that market, I just I don't even look anymore. Unless it's an absorbently bad rate. Yep. Which sure, is my only sure. thing. Where I look at it's like, oh my gosh, whoa, there must be something going on in town. And if I find better rates somewhere else that's really legitimately a greater rate, then I will make the step over. But it has to be a pretty big margin for me to step away from them. That to me is not brand loyalty. That's location loyalty. That's, well, right. That's exactly. Like well, it's it's brand loyalty, but it's loyal to the brand that is that hotel. You know what I mean? Yes. I would argue most brand loyalty doesn't exist today in the sense that we once knew it. Actually, there's a lot of studies that show it doesn't exist. Uh, McKin McKinsey did a study a couple of years ago where they uh, took a group of people and said, okay, how many of you are brand loyal, right? Highly brand loyal, right? So then they took those groups of folks and they did a longitudinal study where they studied that same group of folks uh, repeatedly over the course of a couple of years. And what they discovered was a year later, the group of people who claimed to be highly brand loyal weren't, a uh, half weren't. Right. Really? So 50 percent of the people who claimed to have high brand loyalty when asked about the same brands a year later were no longer loyal to that brand. Right. The, the challenge with a brand is there are brands you can be highly loyal to. You can be highly loyal to Harley Davidson. You can be highly loyal to Fender. You can be highly loyal to uh, Porsche or to, you know, uh, um, a great hotel that might have multiple you know, properties, uh, you know, there's a story about Belmond is putting itself up for sale. You can be highly brand loyal to Belmond, you know, call it what it, everybody else used to call it, Orient Express, you know, um, because you knew what you were going to get and there were certain standards and they always met them. The problem with brand loyalty today for most hotel chains and and I'm obviously an advocate of chains where they're appropriate, but the problem they have is that the product is sometimes so inconsistent or so uh, undifferentiated from every other property in the market, regardless of the flag, that how can I be loyal to a box of rooms that's just like the box of rooms across the street? You know, if I were to stay in a Holiday Inn Express, or I were to stay in a Residence Inn, or I were to stay in a, a um, you know, a, a courtyard or I were to stay in a uh, Wingate Inns and I were sitting in the room, could I tell those properties apart? Could I tell those rooms right. apart? Right? right? How can you be loyal to one of them? If the answer is no, how can you possibly be loyal? Mm -hmm. Right? And that's the problem is that they are undifferentiated or they're inconsistent one or the other. Right? I can't be loyal to something if I go to one and I get treated one way, and I go to another one of the same brand that I get treated a very different way, well, I'm not going to be loyal to that brand. Right. So let me ask you, I mean, that's a, not a hypothetical question. Uh, let, me, let me back up why I'm about to ask this. So um, when I put out this pitch to this group as to give me your gnarliest revenue management problem that yeah. we can try yeah. work for you. And, of course, I didn't have one. I finally had one that popped up. They're doing a completely rebranding, reflagging of, of, of their hotel. Uh, and it's, you know, big footprint, casino, so forth and so on. And I didn't want to be mean sounding about this, but most of my, and, and I was listening participation from the audience as to what they thought, but they didn't want to help a competitor. They didn't want to, get, they didn't sure, want to give sure. that piece of puzzle. So I kind of got aggressive with my solutions for them mm -hmm. uh, by pointing out how you can rip the business out of your comp set, mm -hmm. literally, mm -hmm. how to target your comps, uh, pinpoint them by address, rate, do proximity marketing around them, tag and flag them, sure. literally take away 
their audience from underneath of them because they identified their, their audiences identified as being connected to them and really showed them methodologies real fast on how to do that about in Facebook, putting your pin down, doing sure, a radiant sure. thing, anybody that doesn't live within 99 miles, targeting people that follow the memberships of these uh, the competitive set, going into your TripAdvisor, wiping it clean, which they're going to do anyway, get the magic first 50 that's going to put you four to five, which puts you higher in the stack for a short period of time, low rate your yield, give immediate benefits and, and amenities to people coming back to your hotel so that they identify as preferential to come back to you because of the repeatability of 18 months, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I just threw it at them. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, guys, you aren't going to help. Then I'm going to tell you how this guy is going to about to take business out mm -hmm. of your pocket. Mm -hmm. And they're all sitting there going, and that 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 aggressive, like, this is stuff that can happen in the real world because it does. Mm -hmm. uh, they're sitting there. And I think that actually made a harder point for them than all the other stuff I was talking about because it was like, this is somebody that's taking what we want to do for ourselves and literally beating us over the head for this. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the stuff that could be used against us. If we don't learn how to do this stuff, somebody like him is going to help somebody like him mm -hmm. do this against us. And I think sure. that made a, a much more profound point. That being said, I'm, I told you about how I like the encore and the fun stuff with it, and it's, it really is a nice feature. And I, and I haven't stayed at certainly enough Las Vegas hotels. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been a few, but not all of them. Uh, they all have a unique feel, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is so yeah, nice. If right. I come back, I look back. How, in your mind, with a, a market full of uniqueness, that each hotel has beautiful palace. I mean, this has flowers and stuff. It's gorgeous downstairs. It's a lot like the Bellagio. You know, of course, the Bellagio is the, the benchmark for them for what they do. And then you have Caesars and you have MGM and you have all these amazing places. How, that if you're already unique, how do you see a unique property bringing somebody back beyond the uniqueness that they already currently offer. How do you see them being that, what we just talked about that, that, that I'm, when I go to Vegas, I stay at that hotel because of what, what is that? Well, I mean, I think it comes down to a couple of things, right? First is, do you have differentiated service? Do you have something where if I'm a property, if I'm a guest, I know what I'm going to get and what makes it different and special and meets my needs. You know, you gave a perfect example a moment ago with the, the truly pet friendly property. They've really owned in their market. We're all about pet friendly. I've seen select service properties. I, I knew a great one uh, back in my Wyndham days uh, who they built a um, sports. They owned this big field next to the property, right? And they basically turned it into a mini sports complex. So for the teams that were traveling to tournaments and things along those lines, you know, college and high school and travel teams and the like, hey, we got a baseball diamond, we have a soccer field, et cetera, that you can use when you're here to actually, you know, get a workout in and things along those lines, right? And they did a very good job with that market. So they had service, you know, elements that differentiated them from their competition. And then it gets to the things that I hate to say that these are typical, you know, the typical playbook, because it's it's not typical when it's well executed, but it's do you have a good email list? Do you have a good email marketing program to these individuals, right? Do you do you contact them regularly and update them on things that they should be aware? Do you offer them a compelling value proposition in terms of rates and packages? And I don't mean discounts. I mean value adds that make it worthwhile for them to consider you the next time they're going to be in town. Do you have any sense of their travel patterns, right? The, the challenge that a lot of select service properties have you know, when we talk about outside of Vegas or outside of, you know, destination markets, the challenge that they have is that they have a small number of people who are going to stay with them every time because they're in town a lot. Mm -hmm. And they have a fairly large number of people who are going to stay with them once because they're driving from point A to point B and the property happens to be somewhere along the way. Right. Right. So it's you have to understand that for that second category of folks you know, getting a repeat stay from those folks is very hard and may not be possible because the reality is, you know, I, I was taking my kids, to, uh, I'm a mythical guest. I'm driving my kids down the I-95 corridor because we're taking our once in a lifetime trip down to Orlando or down to historic Williamsburg or something like that. But next year we're going to do something else entirely. You know, I've already been to Williamsburg. I don't need to go back. So the fact that I'm going to stop at this property in, you know, Delaware it's not going to happen again, right? The random is so, right. Right, right. So you have to understand which set of guests fall into which category and then do the right thing for each of those. How do you appeal to those folks who are coming to you for the first time 
versus how do you get the folks who are coming to, you know, you got the, the gray collar worker who has to go see clients in town every month or every quarter. How do you get those folks to come back repeatedly? And do you really understand which bucket those guests fall into? And do you have the right marketing programs around each bucket, around each segment? And, and I think you make a really good point because I think that, that from my perspective, and I'll, I'll tell you why in this moment is why I think that they're leaning towards the, the guests that have the opportunity to repeat their stay with you, mm -hmm. the ones that have expressed that, whether by business travel or what have you, that they're mm -hmm. going through, really need to be focused on. Mm -hmm. Because, wait, I'll tell you a, a little bit of my well, reality now. Before, before I'm gonna. I want to hear what you have to say on this, but I would. I would just say when you say really need to focus on, it depends, right? Because that might only account for forty percent of your business. Yes, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't focus on it because you want to make sure you get all of that forty percent of your business. Right? It's not an either. It's not an either or. I guess it's probably Correct. a better way. Right. To make that's it. that's the only or. point I wanted to make. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's. I want to focus on it because it's a sustainable market segment. It's. A, it's like having. Oh it's sure. Like finding a sure. wellspring of water that's perpetual. Maybe a small trickle, it's but an it's annuity. Right. Yeah. Compared to the deluge you get once a year, kind of thing. So the right. reason why right. I said this is like. My travel world, and, and this was a road trip that I just took. I had to go see a family, uh, go to a family reunion in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. On our trip back, we wanted to slow it down and just kind of be tourists on the way down. Well, weather changed our schedule, which also yep. meant it changed our travel pattern, which also yep. meant it changed our stay pattern. So yep. hotels that I checked in, my wife is phenomenally excellent at this. You know, she'll look and she'll book at two or three others. It gives us branches to go to. And yep. with cancellation policies intact, when and how to cancel them and move them to be able to sure. be canceled and so forth keeps that juggle going. Now, I'm the person that's showing up in your hotel once because um, right, the, right. the, 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 the right. steering currents right. of the gods made me turn because the GPS said the traffic was a half hour slower that way going nearer to New York. Right. Right. If I go outside New York, means that I have this option. And so we're going to stay here instead of there. We confirm, we cancel. You know, And so I'm that once in the person blue moon that comes through that stays, okay? Um, not that I don't want to appreciate rate, opportunity, inventory, quality of product, sure, whatever no, no, it is. Of course, of course. It's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not coming that way again. I am not going to be, again, as far as I know, in southern Lancaster County, 28 miles out of Pittsburgh right, right, on, right, right, right. on Highway 28 or whatever it is. You know, it, it, I'm not going to be there again, maybe. Right. So, or if I am, I'll be like, so, that, but then again, by the same token, when I pull into the parking lot, there's 15 electro, uh, uh, cherry pickers, okay? of a crew that's coming through, which might have been the you know, same crew that comes through every six weeks. I damn straight, if I'm the GM of that hotel, want to hear what they have to say about oh, what's going to keep them coming back. Compared of to, course. Mr. Gray, it's been great that you're with us. Hope you're in town again, but you know, it's probably not going to be likely. Yeah, but the, 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 the reason I'm pushing back on this, Lauren, I'm, I actually I agree with everything you're saying, I, except, A, it can't be either or, as you right. said a moment ago, but, yeah. but it yeah. cannot be either or because in many properties, you cannot sustain your business with only that segment. Yeah. And the bigger challenge, the far bigger challenge, is I would argue most properties that I encounter for the first time don't know which of those is true. You Good know? Point. Oh, well, no, yeah, they don't know their segment. You know what I mean? Like, like, uh, if, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a bigger challenge in the first place because... You don't know. There may be cases where it is either or. Maybe seventy percent of your business is repeat folks, and you know, and you're in a tertiary market where you're not going to get a lot of, um, you know, you're not going to get a lot of transient business that's a one-time stay because you're a little off the beaten path. You know, your your big customers are, uh, you know, the cherry pickers you just said, right, or something along those lines. But do you know that, or do you think that? Right, right. Affirmation and confirmation of all this stuff, and right, and, 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 and to agree with you completely, treat every guest at your front desk as the most important guest that you have. Well, of course, of course. This is this is the distinction of if I say I think you should have pink and white roses in your lobby, and the cherry picker dude goes over and says I hate roses, you might consider a smaller bouquet. Right, right, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right you know, for sure. But the 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 idea of it is is that. From a marketing perspective, and, and this is another blank stare I get a lot. When I start talking about business cycle 
and mm -hmm. demographic profiling mm -hmm. according to business cycle, the differentiation of your market types. Because I, I, I bring this as a conversation point of how to, when I get asked or need to explain how to identify filters within your marketing strategy, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. talk about personas and how to create, or if you don't already have, which you should, personas, and not mm -hmm. one persona fits all, and that persona fits business cycle. And it's not the only person walking your door, it's a predominant person walking your door. So with all right. the qualifiers in place, you, you, you go where you try to start asking them to quantify this, but the biggest blank stare I get is that revenue management and marketers do not approach their marketing uh, methodologies from the idea of where are we in the stream of business? Where, right. where, right. where are, you know, where they look at it as this entity of, okay, we have to market ourselves and we're a hip vibe, you know, with a tray chic interior with oversized pillows and, you know, whatever. It's like, yeah, you're describing fixtures. You're not right. describing marketing. You, you're right. giving anonyms and, 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 and context to what it is that you're selling, but you're not describing your marketing. Yet. When you start talking about uh, mid-20s to mid-30s, uh, non-married, uh, adventurous travel, uh, slightly athletic, uh, urban-esque, you know, when you start talking those terms uh, for the uh, early parts of uh, February into March that transitioned into a uh, 35 to 40 uh, business traveling, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now you're mm -hmm. talking methodologies of demographics and popularity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to time segments of business that you can begin to just say, okay, well, if that's the lion's share of who we want to focus, we can create market strategy around them. But then mm -hmm. who else is walking in your door? Who else would find it interesting to walk in your door? Right. And right. then create those alternate perspectives that isn't maybe exactly the same for the marketing that you're doing with the, the lion's share one. And mm -hmm. that's that's when the conversations get smart and interesting. And, Absolutely. And the, the property can give some great insights because they're the only ones that know this shit. I mean, I can look at numbers But they often all day. don't. They don't. But they often don't, right? I yep, mean, they don't. The, and, you know, uh, we come at this from slightly different perspectives. I agree with everything you said. I actually care less about demographics. I certainly pay attention to them, but we focus first on behaviors, right? We focus on, you know, what are the search terms that you show up for at different times of year that people are, where you're answering the questions or where people who are coming to your market are asking those questions. And if you're a good answer, do you even appear in that search? Yes, I, I, I don't disagree. I'm, I'm, so demographics is a component of the conversation. Of course, it of certainly course, of is. Course. It, it's certainly like, this is right. how we do it. But, Again, and, and, and to your point, the behavioral of it, I, when I do search, and I'm going to relate this, I, I hate to say you never want to sell it yourself, but I, I use it as an echo chamber as to how I think other people have to go through what we force them to go through. Mm -hmm. When you're searching for things, you're not using terms all the time that you are personally comfortable with as a persona representation of yourself. You're using terms that you think will have the most effect to find what it is you're looking for. Oh, sure. So if right, I'm, right. If well, I'm looking for nobody wants a drill, everybody wants a hole, right? Right. Right. But again, that's a component of the data, right? Another right. component of the data is what do people talk about in TripAdvisor reviews for your property and your market, right? What are the things that they like? What are the things that they don't like? What's their what's their sentiment about those things, right? What is, to your point, obviously demographics play some role. Psychographics play some role. If you're a if you're primarily a B two B property, firmographics play some role. What is you know, what's the per diem on the, the business travel accounts for your target what customers your who are coming? To see? Correct. Yeah. Right. I mean, all of these things play a role in it. But again, it comes back to is that is that 80 percent of your business or is that 20 percent of your business? And is it the folks who come all the time? Is it the folks who come some of the time? Is it the folks who come once or is it the combination? And what is the breakdown of those? And are you doing the right things to answer the questions in the guest journey for each of those segments, for each of those groups? And if you are, you're putting yourself in a good position. And if you're not, you're, you're putting yourself in a position to get your lunch eaten. Yeah. Well, and, and I made this example before for, for a different reason. When I was speaking up in Vancouver years and years ago, I had a gentleman come up to me and he says, Lauren, that's some great stuff. Boy, that's some crazy cool stuff. But I'm in Yellowknife, Canada. And yep. um, half the year, I got oilers. Right. And half the year, I got nobody. You can shoot a cannon through and not hit nothing. Right. And, uh, you know, so all this e-commerce thing. Story, by the way. About, yeah. You know, ain't gonna be, and then, of course, you know, as he's walking away, he says, but if you're one going 16-point elk or, or 24-pound bass, let me know. I'm like, hey, can you do that on some of the months that you're, you're, you're not busy? He's That's like, exactly yeah. right. 
but the marketing idea of this is is that for half the year you have to you have to see that okay i just need heads of, i need a bed that people can crash in because they're working their asses off no sure sure, sure. Half of the year, i need to have brochures i'm being coy you know about uh deer hunting and fishing you know and have uh information about people that are local guides or river patterns or whatever it is like that right you know right. Uh, so there is a demographic component to it. There's a business cycle component to it. Of course, there is a, of course. There is a, there's a behavioral part to it. And from what you just pointed out about from a, what are people searching for, um, you have those who are saying places to stay when busting acid, oil refinery, and Yellowknife. And then you have another group of people saying how to find a 16-point buck in the middle of BFE. You know, uh, right. Kind of, well, you know, and, I mean, that gets to a great question of, you know, did that property create any content? Where's the content about why this is a great destination for this? I mean, this gets to a core thing that I, gets lost so often that is a hotel marketing and hospitality marketing 101 that we forget all the time of you got to sell the destination first, right? Yes. If you're Yellowknife, why is anybody going to Yellowknife at all? If you can't answer that question, how are you supposed to sell your property? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Why are they coming to your marketing? And I, again, and I think this is the part that makes people not that, 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 that they shake their head that they don't think about or hadn't thought about. There is time sequence to this. This isn't a single answer. Of course. Of course. It's, no, it, no. It, right, it's a right. layered answer based on the cycle of business that you have. Um, right. To your point where, you know, knowing about your business and your market, the industry and your market is indicative of when that is a component of your business That's cycle. Exactly right. Compared to that, that was the reason why I was well, that example. Out. I would, I would argue, I would, I, I agree with what you're saying. I would, I think where we, I don't know if we disagree or if you're just saying it's slightly different than the way I'm thinking about it. I would argue most hotels know when they're full versus when they're not full, right? Oh yeah, I'll give them that. I, you know, the issue is when they're not full. What I run into far too often is, well, it's seasonality. What are you going to do? And and I think what you're saying, and my argument on this for sure would be, seasonality should be your competitor's problem. Somebody's coming to your market during those off seasons. Somebody's coming to the market during the shoulder seasons. And much to your point, why are they coming there? Who is that guest? What do they care about? What are the reasons for being there? Who are they? And how do you make sure you get in front of them and appeal to them at those times so that if they've got a choice of, you know, five properties in town or 10 properties in town or 20 properties in town, they choose you. And unless you're the only hotel in town, you can always steal the business from somebody else. to. Well, that's what I'm saying. Right. That's exactly what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. But seasonality should be your competitor's problem. Right. But uh, if there is a hundred people coming to town and, you know, every night and you are a hundred room property and there's, you know, two other hundred room properties, it should not be 33 and one, 33 and one and 34 and one. It should right. be 50 or 60 in yours. Right. <laughs> right. Whatever they happen to scrape from the rest. Yeah. Right. Whatever they have to scrape over what's left. Right. Yeah. Right. But I would also add, and then I get it. I think we're saying it differently, but agreeing on the same topic of this. I would, I, I would add to that, that there's a seasonality. Yes. Hotels by nature, know when they're full and they're not. I would also contend that they don't know what they're full with. Correct. And I don't know why they're empty without. Because That's correct. I, I agree I with that completely. There are hotels that are happy to get what they get to fill up. And then there's hotels that wait for others to fill up. And they fill up what they need to go over and, and, yeah, and they get the top of it up. Yep. You know, so, so knowing who's coming because it is season and then refining what you want out of those people that are coming because of it is an as important strategy as it is just to be busy during season. As also, to your point, oh, when it's shoulder or off, to say, I just don't want anything. This is what I want out of it. I want to be able to hold an integrity of strategy of this. I don't uh, want to sell one, what is normally a $300 a night room for 50 bucks because that's what's going to get me off season business. I'm going to want to go over and say, I want to sell a $150 room, a $300 room for 150 right, bucks right, right, because right. of the advantage of being off season that you're getting. And the advantage of what I can provide you that the guy across the street cannot. Right, right. And, and that goes back to my Las Vegas right. question is like, you know, you look at that the, the, the market is full of diversification and uniqueness. Mm -hmm. But then there is also the uh, ding, ding, ding commonality. And I say ding, 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 because, you know, when you walk through the casinos, yeah, it is course, that, that that perennial that backdrop. Is, that's that's the bell ringing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you were looking at the penny slot winner from last night. I went over and uh, we went over and had dinner and I walked out and they, you know, they have all the machines and stuff. And, and I'm not a gambler. I just, it's, it's fun. Sure, sure, sure. And, and so I approach this like, if I put money into it, it's entertainment money. If it goes all the way, I had fun thinking I could make something sure, off of it. Sure, you know? sure. So 
uh, uh, Jen Hager, Jenny Hager, who runs the uh, chapters for all of uh, North America. And she, her and I went for dinner after the event yesterday. And so we both hit the penny slots. We both put 20 bucks in. She ended up losing hers. And I had some sort of cascading something or other. You kept going up for two. Anyway, I ended up making 80 bucks or so off of it. So I, I gave her back her losings. And uh, we're like, penny, penny, penny. You know, I'm the penny, I'm the penny winner. Because it was just penny nice. slots. That's all it was, was penny slots. It was, Look it was, out. Here's the last of the high rollers, oh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm in the penthouse, that's baby. That's great. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> No, but that's exactly right, Lauren. I mean, you and I are saying the same thing. I think we approach it from slightly different angles, but it's yes. it's all about you need to understand who your guests are. You need to understand what your value proposition is to those guests. You need to make sure you convey that value proposition. You need to make sure you choose the channels that make it most, most effective to reach them with that message. And that's mm -hmm. actually how you build a marketing strategy that works, right? It's not about just take what you can get. It is about go get the stuff that's good business for you. Yeah, I tell you what. Okay, so you do it with class intact. I do it with brash and 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 tactlessness. I think. <laughs> I, I think we should find some client I'm from Jersey man. Trust me, there ain't a lot of class intact here. No, uh, no, dude, you're much more. See, I, I would we wrestle. Them. We wrestle them to the ground, shake them upside down, and tell them what they bought. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. Um, no, I think we should find some client that will listen to both of our pitches just to let us hear the difference. Because I can see where you, I don't think there's to... a difference, though. I don't, Lauren. In all sincerity, in, in all sincerity, we're saying the same thing. We're coming at it from slightly different perspectives, right? Sure. No, no. I think from, from an end result, but I think from a presentation point of view, I think it'd be well, no, sure, sure. a difference of it. Yeah, because I think I think they would say something stupid in front of you, and you'd be like, "That's an interesting perspective, uh, Bob." Um, have you considered such and such? I see you doing that. That happens to me. I'm like, Bob, that's the dumbest fucking thing. <laughs> well, I don't. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I always take it for granted, right? That if they're saying something that sounds dumb to me, that maybe there's something I'm missing. Help me understand why you think that thing that you just said is a good idea. See, I, it may not the be. Next part. No, no, no. But it's 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 it's. <laughs> You know, it's funny. I, I played, this is going to sound way more erudite than I, I was a kid from <laughs> York, New Jersey, right? But I was on the chess team when I was a kid, right? And I was in this chess competition one time. And five moves in, I moved my queen into an aggressive position and mated the guy, you know, and I went checkmate. And you saw literally every, every, uh, um, every head at the table, like whip around real quick, like, oh my God, he housed that guy in no time. Uh -huh. And and what I'd forgotten to do was position my knight to protect uh, the queen. Oops. And the guy looked at the board and went, no, it's not, and then took my queen. Uh, and it was, a, it was a great lesson in don't get too far out over your skis. Yeah. You know, yeah, 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 when yeah. somebody tells me something that's incredibly dumb, and I'm like, man, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, I always try to take a quick step back and also say, all right, what do they know that I don't that makes that not dumb? Because something and, 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 led yeah. them to that place, right? Yeah. No, it may I, still and, be I, I dumb. Do. I want to be fair. It may yeah. still be dumb. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not as that boisterous as I do. No, no, no. I know, I know. But by, by the same token, I will go over and be more. And and I, I and you know you and I both know Jay Hubs. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sure. Sure. I, I I tell him this to his face all the time. I am in awe of his ability of timing. Uh, I give it. I put him into the class of like a Johnny Carson or somebody of knowing, and not from a comedic point of view, but from a, sure. a knowing when to drop what needs to be said. Uh, yeah. Because I'm not that person. I am the antithesis of that person. <laughs> my brain is connected to my mouth, and usually not in that order. Um, <laughs> and, and so, yeah. So my brashness usually comes from is when somebody says something, and I know that there's a fact I can bring that is now to my point. I also be the first to admit when I'm wrong. Oh, because sure. to me, that's the only so if, if I say that's dumb and I think I have a great, brilliant idea, and then to your point, I find out that he, they knew something I didn't that made it right. I'm like, damn, that was right. I'm bad. I, I, they, they, you're completely right. And I think it's an endearing and jeopardizing position for what I do because as a consultant, you're supposed to come in as an authoritative, understanding person. And I'm more of like, look, I got a bag full of tricks and some of them are going to work. Some of them ain't going to work. You probably know more about what you're doing than I do, but I think I can help what you want to get done. So maybe we can do something together. Is my mentality to this. You can walk in and be like, yes, you need what I can do, and I can orchestrate this. And so, so you have a stronger presence about you. Jay has that as well. And, you know, but 
but you know, it's it's, it's, you do. You have, it's I different think, approaches. It's just different it approaches. Is. We, it is. It we're is. trying to get to yeah. the same place. You know, I will tell you, I, 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 there's a there's a concept. I don't know where I first read this, but uh, do you know TVTropes.com? TVTropes.com. No. Okay, it's the biggest time suck in the history of the internet, <laughs> and that's and that's really saying something. If you like TVs and TV and movies and all this other kind of stuff. And they basically lay out all these cliches, right? These tropes uh, used within, you know, media, within TV, books, you know, et cetera, to tell a story, right? Uh, you know, things like the five-man band, you know, that you got a cast of characters where there's five people and they each play a specific role. You know, there's, for the villain, you've got the dragon, you know, which is the, the really strong one of the villains, you know, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of things like that. Um and there's this idea that they have of in a movie, it's always, you know, in a movie or TV show, it's almost always played for laughs of the strategic F bomb, right? Is what they call it, you know, where nobody swears at any point in the movie until one person just goes off. Oh. <laughs> right? And it's very funny, right? Yep, the strategic yep. uh, you know, I am a big fan of the strategic bullshit, right? Like, well, somebody <laughs> will say something and I'll just go, bullshit. Yep. Bucks it, call you, don't you. Often, you don't need to use it often. You just bring no. it out when it's necessary. And it's it's the same thing of when somebody's saying something that's legitimately like, nah, I don't buy it. Like, I yep. just don't buy it. I've heard everything you have to say, and I don't buy it. You know, so it's it's just a question of picking your spots versus, you know, being Dude, more out there. Neither is wrong. It's different approaches, right? That, that's funny you say that because, I mean, I, I, as you're saying this story, it's like, I, I remember times where I've done it where uh, back in, in, in when I was with an ownership group and the brand was coming in and they were touting, I know it was just complete BS. And I know that the person that was talking about it literally did not do what they said they did because there was no feasible way in their platform right. they could do it or so Correct. forth. And that they just did it a day or two before to you know say that they did it. And so I literally on my laptop uh, uh, pulled the login for the brand, spun it around and said, go ahead and log in, show me exactly what you do and I will apologize to you that I am wrong. And right. they couldn't even log in because they hadn't logged in for so long, their password didn't work. And so right. I said, I'll even take that problem from you. And I logged into mine, spun it back around. So maybe it has some technical, I don't know. Here it is, right in front of you. Hit the buttons that show to do this. And it, they finally confessed. And at that point, we actually got productive, to be right. fair. Right. That, right. that won't get broken down. And the other was, is that in other circumstances where I had uh, another vendor come in. So I was one of two vendors in front of a client. And the other vendor was pontificating and pushing and being this and being that and how they were thought of this. And they had lots of little minions that were all, you know, the, the, right, you, you know, right, the right, dynamics right, right, of the room right. looking and approved. And I just, to your point, I said, not, sorry, bullshit. Right. <laughs> and yeah. everything stopped. And they, and they tried to first off act defiant. And then I, ham- I made the point that I know I had in my pocket about it. And then the client immediately just stopped talking to them, stopped listening, stopped looking. Shifted it everything over to me and started listening, talking, and learning. You know, it's like that's, right. that's why they he actually put this together was because he needed an answer to something that apparently we weren't saying the same thing on. You know, so one of my all time one, one of my all time favorite uh, tools. I was going to say tricks, but it's really a tool when I go in and do an audit for clients. You know, is you know you look at their paid search, right? Well, there's a log in. Google and uh, in Google AdWords and Google Ads that shows you every change that was made to the search campaign, <laughs> and the number of times this doesn't doesn't happen all the time, but it happens more often than you think. Where you go in and you look at that, and the changes happen an hour before the monthly scheduled call every month, mm-hmm. right? And that's the only time that the agency or whoever's doing the work has ever yes. looked at yes their paid yeah. search campaigns, right? Um, and half of those times. The, the user that did the changes was an automated script, right? Where it's not even a person who's looking at your account and saying, this is what needs to happen, this is what needs to happen, this is what needs to happen. It's, we ran the script and the script made the changes and we did it once a month so that we could come to the thing with our monthly reports or our quarterly yes. reports or whatever. And, you know, We're yada, down 20% yada, yada. of revenue, but we've corrected for that. Yeah, Correct. 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, right? So I mean, yeah, and you need to be able to you need to be able to call bullshit on that when that's the case, yep. right? When somebody's doing stuff like that, it's like, wait a second, are you re- do you have you really thought about this client? Have you really thought about what their needs are? Are you really uh, are you really adjusting what you're doing to accommodate their actual problem, or are you simply running a playbook? 
right? With no thought to how this actually applies. Right. You're checking a box. You're checking a box. And you run into that far too often. Uh, Rafat Ali wrote a great piece uh, um, uh, this past week about the 21 uncomfortable truths that I've learned about the travel industry. And I took issue with one of them slightly. I'm going to read the point. Um, uh, Where is it? Um, He said, uh, the consultants run amok on this industry that fears change, and they milk it for what it is worth. Right? And he goes, there's more to it than that. But, you know, his point, and I think it's valid, is, you know, this is a... uh, this can be a target rich environment as a consultant because there's a lot of nonsense out there. There's a lot of foolishness out there, right? I don't think, I don't think we market for all it's worth. I think we try to provide a service where, you know, people who should know better don't. Right. And that's the real challenge we run into. There is too much disinformation. There's too much. Well, we run this, we run this playbook for everybody and it works for everybody. And then properties go, yeah, but it's not working for me, right? Right, And that's a problem. And I think that's something, you know, I don't see that as, by the way, speaking of somebody who consults outside of the hospitality industry, that's not unique to the hospitality industry. No, I wouldn't say that. There is a, it, but there is a lot of misinformation out there. There are a lot of agencies who I think do a half-assed job, not all of them by any stretch, but, know. you know, and I think there are agencies where if you're a good fit for the type of property their playbook works well for, they're going to be spectacular for you. And I think there are agency, and I think those same agencies could be terrible for other properties where you don't fit their playbook well, right? Mm-hmm. It's an excellent playbook as long as it's a good match to the property. It's Absolutely. a terrible playbook if it's not a good match to the property. Absolutely. And I, I no, I, that all the time, you know? I, I think, again, I think the niche that I'm finding myself more and more comfortable in is advocate of truth where bring me in when you need me to answer a question that you have of doubt. And if you don't need me past that point, we're fine. If you need me to execute needed changes, I can be there for you, bring resources to you. But again, there is so many people in the industry that probably really do poster child exactly that statement. They're in for opportunistic evaluation. They try to create a dependency upon them as we won't tell you what is needing to be done, just that we're able to do it. Um, They, they, they work on fear and doubt. Like if this doesn't get done and you're not yeah. aware of it, it's going to fail. And and it's so easy to see that. By and 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 I give any recommendation because I see the white noise of av- of stuff on LinkedIn. I see the white noise of advertisement on on Twitter and so forth of these people that are wanting to be what we do to a different mm-hmm. capacity, whatever capacity they want. And their first push into the space is, uh, don't know about this. We can fix it. Uh, are you doing this? If not, this will put you in jeopardy. And I'm like. This, that doesn't work. That only propagates the problem because nobody right. wants That's right. The only people that bite on that is because somebody's hitting them on the head at the moment about maybe the exact same issue, and they see, right. oh, then I can. I have a rodent issue. Let me go find a rodent exterminator, or I have an ant issue. Let me get an ant exterminator. That's right. And then, and then they get in bed, and then they don't share how it's to be done. They do exactly what you said. That ten minutes before they have the call, they corrected for it. Um, right. And and it's all they don't do it for the benefit of the guests. They do it for the guests' reliance on them, the, the client's reliance on them. And eventually, the client gets to the point where, if they wake up, they they kick everybody out of bed and say, "We're out of here. That's it." That's exactly and if right. they don't, then they keep getting bled to death. You know, death of a thousand cuts and stuff. So yeah, exactly right. unfortunately, true. And you're right. Not just hospitality specific. That is business cycle of many things. Unfortunately, so. Right. Yeah, Lauren. Hey, we, as ever, it's a it's great fun. discussion, but we ate up the ninety minutes like nothing. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I, uh, I, I, I truly find it a great joy to always. I mean, I love when all the other uh, hosts are on. Do not get me wrong. I love how this changes at one minute. It can be six of us. It can be two of us. It can be right, two. Right, right, right. You know, and I love when we get the roll of the dice and it comes up just both of us because I thoroughly enjoy our conversations every and every time we get the chance to talk one on one. Absolutely. Um, and if anybody was trying to talk to us on the channels, I can tell you with me traveling, I'm looking at one laptop. I apologize if anybody was trying to talk to us on Facebook or anything else that I didn't respond to. I sincerely apologize. And any questions you have or any authors, I'm happy to get back with you on. Um, I will be back in the office next week, so I'll make sure that I monitor the other multi platforms we pro- broadcast out to. Uh, Till then, uh, I know you're going to be. Is it next week that you're going to be in Nashville? Next, next week I will be in Nashville, uh, and I will not be on the show. Um, I am. 
uh, have the rare privilege next week of I'm going to the Hotel Data Conference and my wife is going to the Hotel Data Conference. So hey, this is turning into nice. a, turning into a, a leisure trip for us. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the minute the conference is over, we're gonna go. We're gonna head out and find us some country music and some beer and have our, a nice little weekend down in uh, Nashville. So it should be yeah. a lot of fun. You've been there enough times, yes? You've been, you've been a few times in Nashville, have you? Lauren, you are going to fall out of your chair. I have never been to Nashville in my life. Oh, my God. You're going to have so much fun. You're going to have so this much is a, fun. This is a new experience for me. I've, I've, uh, I've done work with Smith Travel before. I've, I've been at other conferences of theirs. I've spoken at other conferences of theirs, et cetera. But I've never been to the Hotel Data Conference before, and I've never been to Nashville before. So this is all new uh, to me. Okay, I'm, dude, you gotta I'm, I'm, I'm as excited, and with no disrespect to the wonderful folks at Smith Travel, I think that the Hotel Data Conference is going to be a great show. they got a great agenda. I'm really looking forward to it. I also am thrilled to be going to Nashville <laughs> for the first time. Yeah. Because oh. at, you might be aware, I'm a little bit of a music fan. So I'm a... Oh, uh, uh, no, no, giddy, no. You're, you're going to be like a schoolgirl. Oh, my God. You're gonna, I mean... I, and that's the thing I don't just to share. I know you got to run, but the thing that Renee and I, and my wife, would not in this, but even when we're in bars at, at 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the performances that were in the bars of everybody trying to be discovered or right. The music was like, how can they not be on a record? They sound freaking phenomenal. And they're only right. given 30 minutes. And then right. boom, they're kicked off and the next person's being shoved up on stage. But um, do tacky things. And I wouldn't say tacky. It's not tacky at all. It's kind of interesting. It's really phenomenal. Um, they have a full scale pantheon. Greek Pantheon. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It just, it's cool to actually go to what we should have looked like. You know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, of course, uh, Vanderbilt's there. And it just, it's just, it's a neat, the music, the walk arounds, the moonshine, good stuff. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the country music, uh, 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 the, the museum. I, I mean, I'm not a full blown country music fan, do not get me wrong, but it is, I didn't know about East Coast, West Coast. I didn't know about, so oh, yeah, many things sure. and, and, sure. and the stories of some of the country artists. I didn't know what they went through to get where they were on some of the stuff. And I'm not sure. talking about the current sure. ones. I'm talking about the old, you know, no, Twain, no, sure. You're talking you know, about... yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it really absolutely. amazing, amazing. And then of course they have some amazing pieces in the museum. It's a beautiful museum. Uh, but yeah, oh, I'm so, so for you. I thought you had been there enough times that, Oh, did you go at the view? Oh, you no, especially. Is... You're yeah, going to be is... a music freaking heaven. <laughs> I am. I am. I am more than a little excited about this. I am giddy oh, like a schoolgirl, man. This is going to be a fun trip. Uh, oh, that's uh, awesome. The, you know, that's the, awesome. The, un the only unfortunate part is, is uh, you know, we have somebody house sitting for us who's only available for a couple of days. Uh, oh. And I have, I have commitments the following week. So we, we're not going to get to spend a ton of time. There's probably more things to do than we're going to have time to do. But we are absolutely... Yeah, some of the mansions. Oh, the mansions that yeah, are around yeah, you can yeah. see... Uh, there's a, oh, so what you know what it is? All this is going to do is stoke the fact that you're going to have to go back because you're going to be like, oh yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. you know, I, I didn't get to do that. I didn't get to do that. I didn't get to. Do that. And of course, and I, and then this happened to us because we were there. Some really great country musicians show up at the bars because they like to be there, you know. And they right. and some big country musicians show up to go over and play and stuff. So, at that, but anyway, all right. Again, Tim, thank you so much. If people want to know more about what you do and where to find you, where is it they can do that? TimPeter.com is the place for all of the stuff that you want to find. You can find me on Twitter using the Twitter handle at TCPeter. And Lauren, awesome. where can they find you? They can find us, me at HospitalityDigitalMarketing.com uh, forward slash live for all of the archive episodes that we have of now 157, the library. Um, and of course, uh, there's a bunch of stuff. I have a, with it being budget season, for those who may not be uh, totally into gear with it quite yet. I do have a budget calculator that's out there. Uh, it's a good stick in the sand. It's not by any means am I endorsing it to be your final authority for budget creation, but it does give you maybe a presence to manipulate numbers to give you a, uh, an idea of where your marketing according to industry standards should be for payments within digital marketing and what percentages should go towards it and it helps you with your channel distributions and so forth. But it's a fun, cool calculator that's on the site as well. Uh, plus a few other things, meta search and other things like that. But uh, that's all at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com. Uh, to replay the episode as well. Anyway, Tim, uh, awesome trip. I've, again, I feel bad that out of all this trip travel I was doing, I dropped the idea of going to Nashville. Like, I just couldn't do nine weeks in a row, so I dropped, unfortunately, the one that everybody else is showing up to this time because uh, I'm with Holly in New Orleans the week after uh, with uh, her training the trainer program. I'm one of her trainers. Oh, uh, excellent. So it's, oh, very cool. Yeah, so it'd be fun. So anyways, Tim, thank you so much. Safe travels, 
And uh, I'll catch you hopefully the week after that. <laughs> hopefully the week after that. All right. Have a great weekend, and uh, I'll see you in a couple weeks. Take care, Lauren. All right, Travel Tim. safe. Bye, Tim. Bye now. Thank you very much.